the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. In the days following the election of Donald Trump, there was tons of unrest in the streets. There were women's marches, climate marches, anti-Trump marches. It was an amazing show of resistance to what is perceived as an anti-other and an anti-science tide riding in America. Millions of Americans mobilized and marched in over 20 major U.S. cities and smaller communities. And while the energy level was high at the events, there was also an undercurrent of, now what? Other than protest signs and social activism, what are we going to do to really get the change we see? How do we organize, contribute, and collaborate to make immediate impact in our turbulent world? With faith in traditional institutions waning, how will millennials use technology to fix problems now that we'll definitely have to deal with? But coming from outside of the traditional power structure, I'm going to take the next few minutes and walk you through my answer to that question. My name is Marcus Davis, and I am a founder of a technology platform called Urban Array. Urban Array is a distributed collaborative social enterprise. We are a technology-first company that embraces a leading role as a social enterprise and a community development organization. We are Web 3.0. We are a networked community of ordinary people working in concert through a technology platform that operates as both a think tank and a project management hub. It allows us to plan, coordinate, support, and implement projects ranging from building community farms to supporting entire social businesses created by our members. Urban Array leverages our community's energy, talent, resources, and collective wisdom to guide our organization in its mission to deliver socially responsible products and services to the market and to help make a positive impact on our shared world. This may not be one of those super short and flashy videos that becomes an instant viral sensation, but I promise to walk you through a concept that may change the way you think change is possible and even consider joining our movement. The genesis of any idea or movement always comes from a set of problems. This is where one would typically motivate others by listing all the problems in the world that we should mobilize against. While it's true Urban Array can have an endless impact on a lot of areas, there are a couple that I would like to highlight. First, politics. Everyone has a position or opinion and our differences from the other are increasingly becoming part of our personal identities. The saddest part of this increased energy is the feeling that things are actually getting worse. That with all this social interest and all these social technologies, people are actually becoming further apart. Unified only in terms of faction, or the warmer term, interest group. During the presidency of Barack Obama, most of us believed that we had taken a huge leap forward in a ton of issues. But for now, whether you are young or whether you're young at heart, I do have one final ask of you as your president. The same thing I asked when you took a chance on me eight years ago. I am asking you to believe, not in my ability to bring about change, but in yours. Yes, we can. Yes, we did. Yes, we can. Thank you. God bless you. May God continue to bless the United States of America. But the inertia of government and the rigidity of the status quo has left many feeling hopeless. What if raising voices, hands, and money isn't enough anymore? What if the traditional routes of making the world better are becoming outdated? Just the old tools of influence of a dying generation. There are three key elements of our political system that have the greatest influence on government being so ineffective at times. First, the two-party system that over time delivers incremental progress but usually just delivers more of the same to the people who need it most. And with the two primary parties' domination so heavily entrenched, it makes third parties almost irrelevant and leaves growing numbers of people outside of the strictly blue or red camps. This artificial duality and stagnation creates an entire class of inactive citizens. We live in a participatory democracy where unfortunately most citizens believe their civic duty begins and ends with voting and paying taxes. And lastly, Citizens United in Corporate Dominance. In late January 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court decided on Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. 
and they decided that corporations and other groups could spend unlimited money on political campaigns and any regulation or limits would be a violation of the First Amendment rights of the corporations. What the Supreme Court did in Citizens United is say to these same billionaires, you own and control the economy, you own Wall Street, you own the coal companies, you own the oil companies. Now, for a very small percentage of your wealth, we're going to give you the opportunity to own the United States government. This controversial decision has sparked plenty of debate over the role of money and corporations in our political system. The most frightening to me is the issue of hegemony. Hegemony is loosely defined as the social, cultural, ideological, or economic influence exerted by a dominant group. In this case, who runs the world? Throughout most of recent history, nation states or countries have been the top level of power. Countries are the largest group that has influence and dominance over people. Over the last century, private corporations have risen in scale to where now they are influencers of governments. Think about it. Coca-Cola has infrastructure, influence, and employees in almost every country on the planet. That means that Coke has official relationships with more national and local governments than the U.S. State Department. What this translates into is that over the next century, multinational corporations and organizations will start to supersede governments in overall reach. If the goal of the 18th century framers was to create a democratic government of the people to provide for the common good, do the new conditions of the 21st century require democratic enterprises created for the same purpose? With growing corporate control of our democracy, the economic system is becoming more and more skewed to benefit those with wealth and power. This imbalance is perpetuating an unequal distribution of wealth in our society. A Harvard study asked 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. The research is startling. First, they were asked how they thought the wealth in the United States was actually divided. Then they were asked about the ideal distribution. Most say that it should look something like this, generally more equitable than they think it is currently. So most Americans already know that the wealth is skewed unfairly. But the most jarring truth is the reality compared to what we think. The ideal is far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think it is. In truth, the bottom 40% have barely any wealth at all, while the top 1% have more wealth than most Americans think the top 20% should have. Let's take a look at one more graph that may make it even clearer. This chart represents all Americans broken down into 100 people across the bottom. The white line represents our ideal distribution, while the green is what Americans actually believe the distribution to be. But this isn't even close to the reality. Here's the actual distribution. The poorest Americans don't even register on the chart, and the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. And the top two to 5% are actually off the chart to this scale. And the top 1%, well, their money stacks 10 times higher than we can even show. So here is their stack in their own column. What all this demonstrates is how regular people are being left behind when our economy is generating enough wealth to cure a lot of our social ills. The poorest are left with no resources or capital to climb out of poverty, and our so-called middle class is struggling day to day and paycheck to paycheck. Children are going to school hungry while youth programs are being cut. Some neighborhoods in our largest cities are becoming ruins. Places healthcare coverage is being threatened and desperation is at an all time high. All to benefit those who already have most of everything. Another issue is foundational to how our economy is designed. We live in a consumption based economy. All of our perceived drivers of growth are dependent on what we consume. It doesn't matter if we really need those things or whether they improve the quality of our lives. That's irrelevant. This type of consumption dependent economy heralded by economists like Adam Smith, while debatable, or at least practical in his time. It was a tenable practice for thousands of years because we didn't have the technology and the scale to be this destructive to our environment. We have outgrown the sustainability of consumerism. 
we now have a population, energy demands, and sourcing practices that are devastating our ecosystems. Lastly, this brings me to our most pressing issue, our environment. If there is one issue that urban array can affect more broadly, it's this one. From helping to beautify urban environments, to creating more eco-friendly enterprises, to lessen the effects of global warming, half a world away. The Earth is our most precious resource. Its destruction is our destruction. And it will make little difference to what income bracket or political party you belong. From the warming of our planet from greenhouse gases produced by mass agriculture, deforestation and energy production, to the mountains of post-consumer waste and plastics that fill our oceans. Our generation must make choices now, whether we are in power or not, to save our planet. One of the main points of inspiration leading to the inception of Urban Array was a TED Talk I saw on the internet back in 2010. It featured writer and game developer Jay McGonigal. In her talk, Games Can Make a Better World, she talks about engagement levels in complex social, mental, and emotionally taxing games like World of Warcraft and Second Life. Uh, my goal for the next decade is to try to make it as easy to save the world in real life as it is to save the world in online games. Right now, we spend three billion hours a week playing online games. Some of you might be thinking, that's a lot of time to spend playing games, maybe too much time, considering how many urgent problems we have to solve in the real world. Um, in fact, I believe that if we want to survive the next century on this planet, we need to increase that total dramatically. I've calculated the total we need at 21 billion hours of gameplay every week. These multiplayer role-playing games, while they may seem like the opposite of action, actually require a lot of passion, intelligence, collaboration, coordination, and commitment. Players are tasked with tough missions that require teamwork and a shared vision. There are several takeaways from examining the gaming world. First, three billion hours a week is a lot, which forces me to ask the question, what could be done to change the world with 1% of that time and energy? 30 million hours a week? 1.5 billion hours a year. Second, what is it about the games people play most that drive them to commit so much energy, both mental and physical? And how can those elements translate to improving the quality of all our lives? Can we convert that energy into rebuilding neighborhoods, cities, and our environment, instead of it going into virtual thin air? Asset-based community development can be defined in terms of what it is not. Most current community development focuses on needs-based development, or diagnosing a community by what's wrong or deficient. Asset-based focuses on what's strong, not what's wrong. It's the idea of assessing what assets any given group has and figuring out how to build projects and improvements around strengths derived from the community. Critics of asset-based thinking rightly highlight that this assumes that communities have all the things that they need internally to solve their problems. True asset-based planning uses the community's strengths as a starting point to hopefully create more immediate action while being supplemented by a needs-based approach. So basically, figure out what we have now and immediately do what we can, then find whatever additional resources we need to acquire. While gaming principles and community development may seem worlds apart, they are critical to understanding the basic workings of Urban Array. Our platform is a fusion of community development and high levels of engagement, designed to make community participation a whole lot easier. Thanks for taking the time and allowing me to break down the genesis and some of the basic workings of Urban Array. Now it's your turn. We need your help. We need web developers, designers, and volunteers of all types to help our movement. And check out the second video coming up next that breaks down a little bit more in detail how Urban Array works. And like our Facebook page, Twitter, or come visit us online at urbanarray.org.